some stuff. I am recording. I'm Mr. Pike. You're listening to Mr. Pike's Productions. And we are going through this book that I've read for many years called By the Great Horn Spoon. We are in chapter five. If you've got a book, open up and follow along. My class is listening here, and we're talking about the land of fire. Follow along in your books. The days grew shorter, and the Lady Wilma beat her way toward the tip of South America, and summer faded quickly from the sea. Jack, who had been going barefoot for weeks to keep cool, now put on his shoes to keep warm. The gold seekers put away their straw hats and dug into their sea chests for woolen underwear. And off the coast of Patagonia, Jack awoke to find six inches of snow on deck and a school of sperm whales off the starboard bow. Now, you might have heard of Patagonia before. It's one of my favorite clothing companies. But they're named after Patagonia in this place. Uh, it's a group of mountains also in South America. Soon the passengers were bundled up in great cocoons of clothing. Thin men looked like fat ones, and fat ones looked enormous. For days, Praiseworthy and Jack watched the crew tighten the riggings, check the canvas against the coming winds and crashing seas of Cape Horn. An air of impending adventure ran through the ship. Jack listened to tales of whaling ships disappearing forever from the roaring Cape, of square riggers with their masts uprooted like trees of brigs driven back by horrendous headwinds and barking, wandering, and endless fogs. Now, I was just sharing with the class a minute ago, I pulled down a map and showed the bottom and the tip of South America where they're going around, and the weather gets extremely rough there. And that's where they're headed. Oh, nonsense, Praiseworthy would say. Mere sea, sea yarns, or kind of like folk tales. But even more forbidding, it seemed to Jack, were stories of sea captains tempted by shorter routes to the Pacific through what was called the narrow and vile-tempered Strait of Magellan. I mentioned that. Through this narrow, vile-tempered Strait of Magellan, their ships were sometimes cracked into two, like nuts between the rocky jaws of the passage. More than one brave captain had turned back for the tender mercies of Cape Horn itself. Here's praiseworthy again. Does he get worried by things? No. Stuff and nonsense, praiseworthy would say, even though he believed every word of it. We may hit a bit of inclement weather, gentlemen, but our good captain will give the back of his hand to the cap. He told me so himself. Why, the wild bull of the seas could navigate these waters with his eyes shut. Well, said Mr. Azariah Jones, I hope he doesn't try that. It'll suit me fine if he keeps both eyes open and then some. Let me show you what the Strait of Magellan would look like. So if there was the tip of South America, let's just say, just kind of like if this were kind of the tip of South America, they were in Rio de Janeiro here in Rio in Brazil. They were sailing around this way and right around here, rather than going all the way around the tip, there is a little shortcut route called the Strait of Magellan. And so that they could actually come around here and swim, go through this strait, and it's kind of like a little shortcut. So they don't have to go around the whole tip. They'd go through this little strait there. And I don't know how much it saved them some time. Here's another map of, um, show the class and I'll show you. So here's the actual map of, whoop. South America, and they would go through the Strait of Magellan is right through in here. So you can see that. So you got to know a bit of the geography in order to understand this chapter. So let's keep up picking it up there. Well, said Mr. Azariah Jones, I hope he doesn't try that. It'll suit me fine if he keeps both eyes open and then some. The mountainous Yankee trader wore a muffler tied around his face as if he had a toothache to keep his ears warm. In the pilot house, Captain Swain studied his charts. The Sea Raven was obviously far in the lead, but San Francisco was yet a long way off. Captain Swain knew well enough the storms lying in wait of the horn, winds that could drive a ship back 20 miles 
for every one mile that it gained. That's not good progress. Nevertheless, the nearer the Lady Wilma crept to the furious tip of the continent, the more eager Captain Swain became. There were waters to test a man's skills. Praiseworthy, who was not born to adventure, was surprised to find it decidingly to his liking. His face was weathered. On good days and bad, he took his brisk laps around deck and enjoyed the sting of the sea on his cheeks. I must admit, he said to Jack, that I am rather keen on having a look at the notorious cape. You might watch for the fires. The fire, said Jack, attempting to keep up with Praiseworthy's long stride. Ah, at Tiago de Fiergo, the captain tells me the natives keep fires going day and night, keep themselves and their sheep from freezing. Tierra del Fuego, land of fire, that's what the name means. A burst of spray rose from the bows and fell like rain. Land of fire, said Jack. Oh, I'll watch for it. Almost without warning, the first storm came roaring off the Atlantic waters, wastes, and bore down on the paddle wheeler. The sun went out like a match. Long, shrieking winds loaded with hailstones struck the ship like buckshot. The oak wheel spun out of the hand of the quartermaster. The Lady Wilma went teetering over on her side, digging her ribs deep into the seas. Jack, who had, not, who had just sat down to a bowl of chowder, saw the bowl fly off in one direction, the chowder in another, and the spoon in a third. I do believe we've arrived off the horn, said Praiseworthy, hanging onto his boiler hat. And again, the horn is the tip of the South America, where the weather is really bad. Um, I do believe we've arrived off the horn, said Praiseworthy, hanging on to his boiler hat. Captain Swain lent a hand to the wheel, rightening the ship and turning her bowsprit to the wind. In the main saloon, the gold seekers had been thrown together in a tangle of arms and legs. No sooner did they unravel themselves when another violent lurch of the ship knotted them together again. The ship's bell rang in the wind. Howling blasts ripped off the tops of the waves. Riding the swells, the Lady Wilma seemed to climb halfway into the sky, only to drop through a crash into the troughs. Jack got wild glimpses of the sea through a porthole, and if he was afraid, he was too busy hanging on to give it much thought. The sidewheeler burrowed into the storm. Seawater came rushing along the decks, and the ship slowed on hatches like so many waterfalls. Sailors in their stocking caps were busy everywhere, battening the hatches and taking in every rag of canvas. Raise your hand if you think you could handle a storm like that out at sea. Anybody think you could, you think you could handle that? Oh, out there, you wouldn't get seasick? No, has anybody been seasick before? It's no fun. You're rocking back and forth and then you feel your stomach getting queasy. I've fortunate, been fortunate to never be seasick in my life. I love being on a boat. I love rocking around, but yeah. a storm like that might be kind of scary. Kind of. Some people sail from here to Hawaii. That'd be fun. Oh, a mere squall, said Praiseworthy, holding onto a post with the hook of his black umbrella. Why, in these latitudes, this is considered a fine spring day, I believe. The weather lasted more than a week. For a day or two, seabirds came out of the sky and rode the yard's arm. The gold seekers emerged from their cabins bruised and sleepless and hungry. Some said it was harder to eat than sleep, and others said it was harder to sleep than eat. But hardly had the seas calmed down when another gale burst from the sky. A gale is another word for a strong storm. Captain Swain no longer left the pilot house. The nights were now 16 hours long long hours and the days a mere glimmer of light the lady wilma continued westing fighting for every foot of water her paddle wheels thrashed hour after hour and day after day being experienced hands praiseworthy and jack helped keep the fire roaring in the furnace despite the crash and thunder of the sea the butler seemed unafraid and jack found comfort in being at his side 
whale oil lamps flickered in the passageways days and night, and it was hard to tell one from the other. The nights were the worst. Jack's hammock swayed and the cabin walls swung. Mr. Azariah Jones wasn't pitched out of his bunk. It was Dr. Buckby. And more than once, Mountain Jim woke to find them both sprawled across him. I've known grizzly bears that were a fight friendlier than this Billy be hanged Cape Horn. Headwinds battled the paddle wheeler to a complete standstill. And <clears throat> Jack began to wonder if they would ever reach the Pacific. The Lady Wilma was thrashing with all her steam just to stay in one place. Remember, they said they would go push back 19 miles and, and go back one mile. But then a calm would set in like a great practical joke. The moment passengers began to snore in their cabins, fresh winds would swoop down and jerk the ship awake. There'll be nothing to do but sleep when we reach the Pacific, Praiseworthy pointed out. The portholes were almost frozen over, and only once did Jack get a glimpse of the land to starboard. Dark cliffs seemed to hang like draperies from the misty sky, and then the weather closed in again, and they were gone. Do you think there's any chance we might catch up with the sea raven? Jack asked, hanging onto his hammock. We could pass within a hundred yards of each other without even knowing it, Praiseworthy said. We can't go to San Francisco soon enough to suit me, put in Mr. Azariah Jones. And I hope we win, said Jack. Oh, I don't think Captain Swain has the slightest intention of losing, said Praiseworthy. For 37 days, the sidewheeler battered and rammed her way through the crashing headwinds that attempted to drive her back. And then, on a Tuesday morning, the sun broke out, clear and sharp, and hung like an ornament in the northern sky. One by one, the deckhands opened up and the gold seekers came on deck, as if from some dark dungeon. Their eyes blinked in the unfamiliar brightness of the day. We made it, Mountain Jim said, throwing down his yellow fur cap. Boys, this here's the Pacific Ocean. A yell went up around the ship and Captain Swain leaned out of the pilot house. His beard had grown an inch. He gave a heavy wave and then came out at the paddle box with his long glass. His long glass, kind of like a telescope, long glass. After a moment of sweeping the seas, he stopped. By grabs, he roared. There she is, the sea raven. And by grabs, she's astern us. I mean, she's right side by side. They finally caught up. Another yell went up and the gold seekers rushed to the after decks for a look. And there was the sea raven indeed, trailing far behind them seemed to Jack the most exciting moment of his life. A remarkable performance, said Praiseworthy, but he was baffled. It seemed hardly possible that the Lady Wilma had charged ahead against the furies of the past 37 days, and yet there stood the sea raven behind them as the proof. I watched for the fire, said Jack, but I, I never did catch sight of them, Praiseworthy. Follow along in your books, everybody. I'm on page 57. Suddenly the butler's eyes lit up. Why, Master Jack, you've solved it. Solved what? You didn't see the fires of Tiago del Fiego because they weren't there to be seen. But you said, I mean to say the fires were there, but we weren't. Do you see what happened? At that moment, Captain Swain had joined the gold seekers on the after deck. Jack had never seen him with such a wide and merry grin glowing from the depths of his whiskers. I hope you gentlemen enjoyed your passage around the horn. And the wild bull said the wild bull of the seas. Captain, Praiseworthy said with a gleam in his eye, Master Jack appears to be on your secret. What's that? We haven't been around the horn, sir. Captain Swain gave Jack a twinkling glance. Is that so, lad? All I said was, Jack said, oh, what he means is that you have pulled off a most daring piece of seamanship, sir, interrupting the butler, interrupted the butler. 
The reason Master Jack didn't catch sight of the great fires at the land's end, why, the reason, sir, is that you took the Lady Wilma through the deadly Strait of Magellan. The Strait of Magellan, you say? The captain rubbed his plump nose. Why, that's a regular ship's graveyard. And then he gave Jack a heavy squint. Of course, it cuts hundreds of miles off the voyage around the horn. Hundreds of miles. A ship's master can't be, could be sorely tempted. You mean to say, sir, said Mr. Azariah Jones, turning white, that we've been bouncing around in that awful place? I confess, chuckled the captain, the lad here has found me out. And then he pointed to the sea raven. Look at her following us, gentlemen, like a chick after a hen. And we'll pick up at chapter six next time. All right, so what he did was basically the Strait of Magellan, as I drew here in this little picture, it was actually more dangerous apparently to go through this little strait than it was to go around the horn because there were, I think it's because there were more rocks and it was more dangerous in, in this strait. A strait is a narrow passage of water that goes through land. And uh, they took a shortcut. How many miles did it, did it cut off? A hundred. A hundred. Hundreds. I think it said three hundred. That's it for now.